All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for an exciting event this evening at uh, Temple Shari Tefila. My name is Seth Frank. I'm the incoming president of the uh, board, and uh, I start my new position and get paid an immense amount of money starting in a couple of weeks. On behalf of those in our sanctuary, we have many people also on the Zoom system this evening. We welcome you to an exciting evening. As a temple, we pride ourselves on being a congregation that focuses on meaning, connection, and purpose, which is an important part of our evening tonight. We'd like to have special thanks to the UJA Federation for sponsoring this event this evening. We take pride in a long-standing connection to the UJA, and many of our members as temple members are also important members of the UJA. Our guest tonight, Ruth Messenger, will be coming up with our rabbi as well. She has a very strong background, as many of you know, a political leader in New York City and was on the council uh, as a council member for many years, representing the West Side. Ruth has also been the president of the American Jewish World Services for a very long time and now is the global ambassador for the AJWS. It is our great honor to participate in this evening's activities and be a partner with UJA Federation. I'd like to ask Jill Franco, who is a member of our synagogue, who has been on the board, and is a leader in UJA Federation to come up and say a few words. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all for coming. Hello, everyone. I'm Jill Franco, and it is my honor to introduce this program tonight. Currently, along with Audrey Lawfer, we are Sheree Tefila's liaisons to UJA. We are so glad that many of you are here in person to join us today, and it's also great to welcome many of you online. This program tonight and the work of UJA in the area of social justice is particularly meaningful since I serve along with other lay leaders, many of whom are here tonight as social justice task force leaders here at Sheree Tefila. Our task force partner with several organizations on issues of food insecurity, immigration, mental health, environmental justice, criminal justice reform, voting rights and civic engagement, gun violence prevention, reproductive freedom, and racial justice. Before I introduce our featured speakers, I want to share a few words about UJA's work in these deeply challenging times. If I was speaking to you just three months ago, I would have focused on how UJA is taking charge of COVID recovery, what's needed to deal with the massive mental health crisis affecting kids and teens, and how UJA is helping those caught in the grip of poverty move from crisis to stability. After the horrific hostage situation in Colleyville, Texas, or one of the countless anti-Semitic incidents happening more locally, we would focus on UJA's Community Security Initiative, which is charged with keeping 2,000 local Jewish institutions safe. Every one of these challenges persists, and every one of them has and will continue to be met with a strategic, nuanced response at UJA. But now with the war in Ukraine, UJA's work has taken a turn none could have imagined. And because of the network they have in place, the same network that enabled a quick response to every other challenge, UJA has been able to respond to the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II. And we at Sheree Tefila have been able to proudly support these efforts. Rabbi Mosbacher participated in UJA's rabbinic mission to Poland and the Ukrainian border in March. 
Many of us were privileged to hear Rabbi Mosbacher's reflections from that mission and how important it was to be there to show support. In addition, UJA staff and leadership have been visiting countries bordering Ukraine to understand what's happening, what's needed, and how funding can be directed with maximum impact. Before the war, there were 200,000 Jews living in Ukraine, including about 10,000 Holocaust survivors. Never did they expect at this point in their lives they would have to flee their homes again, be displaced, and live under fire. To date, UJA has provided more than $13 million in emergency funding to help millions of refugees, as well as the vast majority of people who still remain in Ukraine. Now UJA is also helping our agencies here in New York prepare to welcome refugees. We also need to acknowledge this crisis is just in its first stages. Even if the war ended today, the work of resettling and rebuilding will take years. New cycles will move on, people will forget, but UJ will be there for as long as we're needed. I know that beyond the crises of today, we're setting the agenda for the future. One of the ways UJ does this is by addressing and confronting injustices in the community. A few years ago, recognizing the need to lift up the Jewish voice to contribute to the fight for racial justice, UJA helped the Social Justice Roundtable, a national organization based in DC, build a presence in New York. Today, UJA's funding to the Roundtable mobilizes the Jewish community to fight systemic oppression. UJA responds to multiple crises on multiple fronts simultaneously without allowing crisis to define us, and that's the power of UJA. And that's what our community's support makes possible. Thank you to all those who have stood with us to make all of this possible. Now I would like to introduce Ruth Messenger and Rabbi Joel Mosbacher. Ruth Messenger is the Global Ambassador for American Jewish World Service, an international human rights organization which she ran from 1998 to 2016. Ruth does social justice and organizing work at the Jewish Theological Seminary and at the Center for Social Responsibility at the Meyerson JCC in Manhattan and is the instructor and facilitator for Jewish women social justice entrepreneurs selected by the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. She recently completed development for Melton schools of a social justice curriculum and a racial justice supplement for use by congregations. A trained social worker, Ruth previously had a 20-year career in elected office in New York City. She serves on several boards and has a long family history with UJA. Ruth, we're so glad and honored you can join us here today. Rabbi Joel. <laughs> Rabbi Joel Mosbacher has served as senior rabbi of Temple Sharei Tefillah since 2016. Prior to joining Sharei Tefillah, he served as rabbi of Beth Havarim Shir Shalom in New Jersey for 15 years. A social justice leader with the reform movement, Rabbi Mosbacher serves on the national strategy team of the Metro Industrial Areas Foundation as an, and is a national co-chair of Metro IAF's Do Not Stand Idly By campaign to reduce gun violence. He speaks and writes extensively on issues concerning social justice, Israel, and Jewish values, among others. I now would like to turn it over to whom you've been waiting to hear from, Ruth Messenger and Rabbi Mosbacher. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Seth. I want to thank UJA Federation for making this evening possible and for their extraordinary patience. We started planning an event about three years ago. 
And then something got in the way, I forget that what that was, uh, that, uh, that meant we had to delay, but it was never about a question of if we would do something together, but, but when. We're grateful for our partnership with, U with UJA and are proud of our longstanding connection uh, to UJA and its work, and grateful to Jill Franco and Audrey Laffer for serving as our liaisons um, uh, as well. And thanks all for being here, those who are online and those who are here in person on a day like today, I don't know about you, but I need to be with people that inspire me. People believe that change is possible. People who work every day to make uh, the world a better place and uh, who push even when it feels like uh, the field is tilted. Um, this week, Uvalde, Texas, and Albany, New York, and Laguna Woods, California, and New York City. That's one week in the life of what it means to be an American, is to live and experience gun violence. And um, tonight, more than most nights, I needed to be with Ruth Messenger. And I'm grateful that you're here, grateful that you're our teacher and our agitator and, um, and someone who is relentless in the, in the fight for making the world a better place here and abroad, and grateful to be in conversation with you tonight. Um, I have some questions for Ruth. Uh, we might answer the questions that I have here, or knowing Ruth a little bit, we'll go someplace else, and that is okay, too. Um, and we'll leave some time as well uh, if you have questions uh, this evening. So thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So let me just yeah. say that, I mean, I'm happy to be here and talking with all of you. I hope there will be a lot of questions. Um, and I was particularly moved when I realized that I was coming here today because there really are very few leaders in the movement against gun violence who are stronger and more consistently committed to trying to make change in this country than your rabbi. Um, and I've been part of presentations and heard Joel talk about it and understand as he talks about it, not only the ways in which he can empathize with everybody who is permanently, uh, who is personally a victim of gun violence in, for themselves or their families, but the way in which he understands the genius of organizing to make real social change and to stay with an issue for a very long time. And I, I think you probably all already had your own moments of silence and grieving for what happened in Texas. Um, I happen to live with several members of my family, including my granddaughter who has a two-year-old child. Mm -hmm. And she came into the kitchen this morning and said, I'm never reading a headline again because of what it means to just be a mother at this moment in time. And I spoke to the director of the Washington Office of American Jewish World Service about an hour later and asked her how she was. And she said, I have two children. I think they're about five and six. Mm -hmm. And she said, I was taking them to school and we, we being she and her husband, we couldn't figure out what to tell them or not tell them. So this is an issue on all of our minds, but it's that much more on your mind if you're dealing with a young child. Yep. And as I said, um, Joel is somebody seriously committed to making change and to staying with it as long as it takes. And he and I had a few minutes to converse in the other room. And I, I want to make the point to you that I know he totally agrees with, but that I heard articulated today by the wonderful Stacey Abrams, who, as you probably know, is a candidate for a governor, again, a candidate for governor in Georgia, talking about gun violence. And Stacey said, we are now at a moment in which the quick response from the public is, this is a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. And she said, this is not a mental health problem. Whatever we know about the mental health or the emotional challenges of any one of the perpetrators. This is simply a question of access to guns. Mm -hmm. And anybody who spins this off as a mental health problem is someone who wants to otherize the issue and not deal with the legislative remedies that we have that would limit access to guns. Mm -hmm. So I know Joel agrees, but I thought it was important to start this sure. meeting with that message. For sure. Uh, along the way in my day today, I spoke to four or five parents from the congregation 
and uh, to a person they were, they were afraid to send their kids to school today. One mom that I spoke to who left, her, had to leave the house early, um, said that she had texted her husband and said, please tell our son, age nine, that he's going to be okay at school, even though I'm not sure I believe it. And dad texted back and said, I told him he was going to be okay, but I feel like I'm a, a terrible liar. So when we started our campaign almost 10 years ago after Sandy Hook, I did not think that we would still be here uh, in, this, in this morass. Um, uh, but we are, and we need to keep fighting about this and a whole bunch of other issues uh, that I know that you care about, Ruth, as well. So thank you for those kind words, and, uh, and it's, it's important that we're in this together. I'm curious, as we begin the conversation, um, who have been for you the inspirations in your life that drove you to want to make change in the world, uh, and, and who are the people that continue to inspire you uh, in, in moments when, uh, like I said, it feels like the, the arc of the moral universe uh, will never get bent towards justice. So, um, um, when, I, when I'm asked that question, you know, someplace like people just sort of, know, who's your political hero or whatever, and I, I come up with some people that I admire, but when, when I'm asked to reflect on it more thoughtfully, um, I know that the answers are at both ends, my family. So I'm in this for the long haul, and it's quite now a long haul that I've been in this. <laughs> um, I'm aware of that. Um, uh, because I have three children and eight grandchildren and three and a half great-grandchildren, um, <laughs> and um, I'm really concerned about um, uh, I'm proud of the work that I've done over the last many decades, and I'm dreadfully upset about the country that we're asking these young people to inherit. Mm -hmm. And so they continue to be an inspiration. And I got my training in social justice from my family, and most particularly my mother and my maternal grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so um, since this is an event tonight for UGA Federation, I warned Joel this was going to happen. I warned UJA <laughs> Federation this was going to happen when they asked me to do this. So you'll allow me three or four minutes. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather's name was Israel Edwin Goldwasser. Um, best family records that we have, which are not very reliable. He was born sometime around um, 1880 and actually born on the Lower East Side, which is unusual um, for that era. Um, People were still coming to this country. Um, and um, various tragedies in his childhood in a house of poverty on the Lower East Side. But he was unbelievably brilliant, and so he persevered through family tragedies. He went to City College in its earliest days and got what was then the equivalent of an undergraduate degree a gra and a graduate degree and a doctorate in education. Um, he became a teacher in the New York City school system. He was um, apparently very good. So he was asked to be a principal. So my grandfather was the principal of PS20 on the Lower East Side when Jake Javits, Harry Golden, and Eddie Cantor were students. Wow. Um, wow. And then, this is a relevant story to our understanding about identity and difference, so I'm and, uh, cast differently today, but I'm going to tell you this story. When he, he was the principal of PS20, um, and then we think he was some sort of a district superintendent, but we're not sure on the Lower East Side. And in 1914 or 1915, he was called in by the Board of Education, which at that time was entirely Irish American, and told um, Dr. Goldwasser, we really like your work, and we would like you to think about being um, an assistant superintendent of schools. And he said, I would be honored. And they said, um, you are the youngest person who's ever been asked to rise to that position. And he said, I would be honored. And they said, and you for sure are the first Jew that we've ever thought about bringing into the hierarchy <laughs> of the Jewish, of the Board of Education. 
And he said, I would be honored. And then they said, but you understand that that is as far as you will be able to go. And he said, I quit. Now, in the, that's the story. I think it's true. I will add, just so you all know, um, that my grandmother, to whom he was married, I think was really, really eager for him to uh, make more money than you could make in the New York City school system. Um, and so uh, that's about the time that my mother was born, uh, their oldest child. And so he left the school system. He was true to his word. He left the school system and went into business. And because he continued to feel that he had an ob a social justice obligation, he accepted the position. This should be a drum roll here, but none of you are drummers. <laughs> of the first executive director of Federation of Jewish Philanthropies in New York. Wow. So if you go to the building and go to the, it's either the sixth or the seventh floor where those portraits are, first column, middle row is my grandfather. Amazing. Amazing. And can you say a word about your mom? Because I know she So was, yeah, my mom was probably my, the biggest influence on my life. And my mom, um, my mom was always oriented towards social justice, which I assume is a, a partly from her dad. Um, it is not a household, or it was not a household that was seriously Jewish. Again, I think that was my grandmother. My grandfather, as I said, did federation. He also taught Sunday school at Rodef Shalom. <laughs> um, and I have a booklet he wrote about, which might be the first booklet that anybody wrote about the women in the Bible. It's a little pamphlet. <laughs> nice. Um, but, um, but it was a largely assimilated home. And our route, or our reroute to Judaism, was a wonderful other story. Can I tell another story? Of course. OK, so my mom and my dad met um, and got married in 1938, I think. And my mom's job, my mom had um, an undergraduate and a graduate degree and did not have a doctorate um, in philosophy. But her job was to put my father through accounting school. Hmm. And, um, so she took a job in the opening of the first, the first opening of Queens College. The f head of the philosophy department gave her a job teaching philosophy at Queens College. And in August of that year, the head of the philosophy department called her and said, um, thank you very much for your application and for having accepted the position. We found a man. And um, she had to find a job because she was committed to supporting her husband. And so, side story, the Jewish Theological Seminary was a relatively new institution. Mm -hmm. Louis Finkelstein had just become the chancellor. Now, the next part I'm telling you, I know you think I might be making all of this up, and the next part I'm telling you is actually in the history of the seminary. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, Chancellor Finkelstein basically said, my job was to set up a training program for rabbis and educators. I have the most brilliant um, rabbis and educators to teach this next generation. And I'm now the head of this institution. And now I discover that to run an educational institution in America, you have to have a personnel department, and you have to have a public relations department, and you have to have a community outreach department. I know nothing about any of these things. None of my rabbis or professors know anything about any of these things. And my board won't give me any money. Huh. So I have a solution. I am going to hire the daughters of my donors and supporters Shh because they are really smart and they can't get jobs, so they will work for almost nothing. <laughs> and there are seven or eight women, I forget. Um, Cyrus Adler, who was the big macher behind the seminary, um, called them Finky's girls. Mm. And um, at the funeral of, the, of one of the ones who passed away after my mom, my mom died in 2002, and at the next funeral that I went to, I sat there and computed, and I decided these seven women had given more than 200 years to the <laughs> founding of conservative Judaism it. in America. Anyway, my mother was the director for 55 years, the director of um, public relations, radio, and television at the, at, um, the Jewish Theological Seminary. So she did her Jewish education there. And that became part of our Jewish roots as a family. And now we'll see. Nobody here is old enough. Anybody remember the Eternal Light? Oh, people are getting so old, young. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Eternal Light was, I want to say, with a huge bias, the single best program about religion on um, a national um, airwave. In other words, there are lots of now, every lots of great programs about religion, but they're all on you know channels. 
um, for reasons that I was never sure of. NBC Radio and then NBC Television in the 1950s supported The Eternal Light, which was produced out at the seminary. My mother was the co-producer of The Eternal Light. And it was an extraordinary first half hour radio and then half hour television program in which it did everything. It would explain the holiday of Purim. It would do a little sociodrama about issues in the Jewish community or why this family is celebrating Passover this way. It would interview celebrities like Molly Goldberg and, and Gertrude Berg is her name, <laughs> and um, uh, famous Jews. And it was just like, it was a Jewish program. It's amazing. On, on NBC television. radio and television. On, and when, when I'm getting, you know, but when you speak to an older audience, there are a lot of people who remember being told to come home from Sunday school quickly so they could listen to the eternal, the eternal light. light. That's an amazing story. That's and so I grew up on the, on essentially on that material, and I think it probably helped that my mother was learning it all the time, and mm -hmm. so talking, to, talking it all the time in her household and to her daughters. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing those stories. You are a person that, among other uh, passions that you've had uh, in your life, is the city of New York and making this place uh, a place of justice. Uh, we were talking a few weeks ago in preparation for this conversation about, um, about issues of race. Uh, and we were saying just before uh, that many of us have been to uh, civil rights museums in the South, uh, extraordinary places, important places for us to go and take our communities and our, and our families. Uh, but you said something that uh, is probably worth a whole evening or, or two or many in, in and of itself, but I'm wondering if you could touch on, which is the ways in which uh, we, we might think New York City uh, isn't a part of that story, is, is it, or is a part that was always on the right side of history. Um, but, well, uh, and, and I want to emphasize that that's, that's sort of not an accident. I think that's the way it's taught. I mean, I urge you all in this time of incredible ongoing race, racism, racial division, and turmoil, whoever you are, however you conduct yourself, however you define yourself, whether you're dealing at your workplace with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, just think for a minute about what you were taught. We were basically taught, this is a little unfair, but we were basically taught, and I'm older than a lot of you, but we were basically taught, um, first of all, this is our country. It's not quite clear about that. You know, we beat the British, but nobody talked about who the we was and where we were. But then we were taught that there were, was a problem called slavery, and we fought a civil, and the problem was in the South, and we fought a civil war, the South against the North, and the North won. So slavery was eradicated. Good. And then it turned out um, that there were still some problems, and now in the lifetime of many people here. And so we had a civil rights movement, and we solved those problems. Now, I'm sorry, but that is basically the historical, I mean, you may all be into reading new I think, issues I think and you've hit stories, all the high points of how we were. But that's how it was taught. And, on the one hand, I always knew that wasn't true, and I, in my earliest days of working in New York and moving into city government, I was dealing with issues of poverty and race. But I didn't take enough time to think about sort of like, well, how was I taught it? How were my children taught it? How do we deal with this? And then in these last several years, as it's been clear that we have a huge amount of work to do on issues of race and racism in this society, um, I've started looking at some of the history and with a woman with whom I co-teach, who is a Jew of color and an academic named Tamara Fish. So this next line is hers, but it is my favorite line of all time. She teaches, and we now teach, the myth of the noble north. Mm. There was nothing noble about the north, except that the plantations weren't here, because there aren't many places to grow cotton on 79th Street and 2nd Avenue. <laughs> uh, the largest supporter, supporters of the slavery system outside of the plantation owners was everybody who was anybody in the city of New York. Every business person, every banker, the mayor, Ferdinand Wood, and lots and lots and lots of other elected officials. The strength and growth of New York was on our role as a port city and our role as the center which just emerged of the banking industry. But what supported the port and what supported the banking industry was cotton. 
and what supported cotton was slavery. And over and over and over again, it does not take a lot of, I'm now, we taught a course this year, and we're gonna teach in Tikkun Leil Shavuot in the middle of the night on this next Saturday. We're gonna teach a little bit about racism and in New York City at the JCC. I, I could say a lot more about it, I'll say a little bit more about it in a minute, but I wanna say, guys, that this is important because it's not history. First of all, it's not taught. Second of all, it is our history and we have to understand it. But third of all, you know, this time, that is pre-Civil War, post-Civil War, the last half of the, um, don't get the centuries wrong, 19th century, is not that long ago. And what that did in New York was to define where the races were, how they were seen, how hospital systems were set up, how neighborhoods were set up. And you know, it, it continued, uh, you all know, and I think more people know and understand that the probably single, probably single biggest factor in um, driving race and class differences in America was the affirmative decision by the federal government and the banking industry to make mortgages available to white veterans of World War II and not to black veterans. Mm. And I wanna say, just to be provocative, you cannot convince me that there were no Jews in those rooms. So I don't know who it was, but I know what we believe and what we're told to believe, and there were rooms in which people decided to redline neighborhoods and to deny mortgages, and some of the people making the, all of the, none of the people making those decisions should have made those decisions, but to the extent that I'm tribal, some of the people making those decisions to exclude black people from economic benefit um, were Jews who themselves were fighting exclusion. And that's just an ongoing message to all of us. So I will just tell you that um, there's a fantastic book. There's lots and lots to read on this, but the book that's the most fun to read, which I'll recommend to all of you, is called The Kidnapping Club by a guy named Jonathan Daniel Weiss. I hope that's right. Um, and it turns out that um, People in New York discovered that the Fugitive Slave Act, which you probably remember learning about, which was if you, there were wanted posters for slaves who had escaped from the South, and you could go, and if you saw them on the streets of New York, you could arrest them because they had run away from the plantation, and you could return them. And the people in New York who found that lucrative then organized something called the Kidnapping Club, which was, why not just arrest any black boy or man on the streets of the city of New York and send him to the South? And we did that. People did that. So we have, we, there are no clean hands in most of these stories, mm -hmm. there are, as there are not in gun violence issues right. and all of those issues. But I think it's really important as New Yorkers, because I am a parochial New Yorker in that regard, to sort of look at this history and say that, you know, and last, last historical point I'll make to you in the, in the Lincoln election, um, the state of New York showed an inclination with its electors or its political leaders to support Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And the city of New York reversed that decision and opposed Lincoln. Wow. So folks, we don't, you know, you, you, have to, you don't have to teach that to nine-year-olds and I don't know what you tell eight-year-olds about whether they'll be safe in school, but we have a long way to go. And I've talked to some of the schools that I think are doing, a, some of the private schools, that I think are doing a very good job of trying to diversify their student bodies and diversify their, or, or affirm their commitment to be anti-racist institutions. And I've said to them, I think that's great, but could you look at what you teach? Because I went to a really good school and I didn't learn any of this. And we're not gonna get on top of it unless we sort of learn what the history is. Thank you for that. There is so much work to do here in this country, just an endless amount of work. We talk about it all the time as a congregation, how to, to decide between being everywhere where there's work to do and being strategic about the power that we have. And no matter how many of us there are, there's just not enough of us to do all the work that we do here at home. And you have been so committed and such a teacher for so many of us about the importance of our global responsibility. So I, I wanted to ask you to speak for a bit about how we should think about our global responsibility at a time when 
we could do nothing but work here at home, and, and we in many ways need to, um, and yet we are citizens of the world, and, and how, you, how you see that in, in the 21st All century. Right. I, I do want to speak to that. I, I want to say something different first, because, because this is a time when, when individuals, if you read the newspaper, and communities are beset with everything that's going on. Um, and so I want to say two things about that to a committed congregation. As you say, different issues come up. You may speak or sermonize on some issue, and then something happens, and you some other issue. Mm -hmm. That's appropriate in your role. But I want to urge individuals and the congregation as a congregation and people in whatever circles they operate to do two things. One is, for all of the issues, and I'll talk about global issues in a minute, but, but for all of the issues, individually or in small groups, pick the thing you're most passionate about. You know, you can say thank you to your friends for asking you to sponsor their bike ride for this or their um, charity for that, but change in all of these areas takes a phenomenally long time, which is what you were talking about before. And nobody, none of us, is going to be able to stick with an issue because the rabbi told us to be on this committee or because our daughter asked us to, to support her in doing that. You have to really spend some time. Find your own, I don't know what it is, Central Park, Mountaintop, I don't know, and sort of think through the issues, and I'll talk about global issues, but let's just talk about local issues. What, what is the one I really care about that I can stay at for a long time? And then, as a congregation, and I'm always, I'm always getting in trouble, that's my role as a public speaker, <laughs> so I'm gonna say, as Federation, because you gave a great presentation as to what Federation is doing, but don't move the entire cabal from one issue to the next to the next, okay? I spent a week, three weeks ago, I'm not gonna talk about it now, there's enough going on in Afghanistan, but everything that everybody was hugely concerned about in Afghanistan last year, it's less than a year since the Taliban took over, stopped with Ukraine. And everything about Ukraine not really, but a huge amount of it stopped because of the Supreme Court leak on Roe versus Wade. And if you live in Manhattan, you're now going to be overwhelmed by the lunacy of our congressional redistricting. Mm -hmm. And all of those are issues, and I'll talk about any of those, but in your, in your heart, don't, and in your community, don't just move everybody from one issue to the next. So, so find I a way. That to sort of stick with something and to say, if you're part of social justice at Federation or if you're part of Sherry Tefila, some people are gonna stick with this for a long time. My, my congregation is SAJ. We have a group of people who go to abortion clinics. They've been doing it for five years on Saturday morning and just to make sure people can gain entry because that's still an issue, but people stop talking about that issue. I didn't know till someone in the congregation said we are needed that it was still an issue. So yes, there are a lot of issues. There are also a lot of people. So stick with an issue. And then the other thing I'm going to say, which will get us into global issues in a minute, is every single thing you're doing, any one of you, on any one of these issues, is phenomenally valuable, makes a difference to the people who are helped, whether you're helping with time or with money or whatever else. But please, please, and as a rabbi, spend some time talking about why are things the way they are. So you talked about Ukraine. And I think that Jewish communities around this country, as well as other faith communities, are doing a fantastic job, certainly Federation, of paying attention to the needs of refugees. But, Jolie has heard this before, Jolie has been on the board of American Jewish World Service, so I get to tell you a little parable which she's probably heard a thousand times. <laughs> there was a town in some place, and there was a river, and one day the children in the town came running to the town elders and they said, quick, 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 there's a body in the river floating face down. And the town elders ran to follow the children, and indeed, there was a body floating face down, and they found a hook and a piece of rope, and they pulled the person out, and he was still alive, and they started doing um, artificial respiration, and then the kid said, there's another body. And lo and behold, there were bodies floating down the river, and each time they would pull them out and do artificial re resuscitation. 
And then the kids suddenly started organizing and leaving the scene of the disaster. And the elder said, where are you going? And the kids said, we're going to find out why there are so many bodies falling in the river. And so I just ask you to remember that all the time. There are reasons for all of these things. And we will sadly, and as a Jewish community, proudly, because of our history, respond to every need from every new set of ref for every new set of refugees. But the question for each of you, and I'm going to be tough here, is what do you think the United States policy on immigration should be? And what do we have to do at the White House and in Congress to get ourselves an immigration policy? Hmm. Because we will be beset with immigrants and refugees forever, but we don't have a system to move us beyond coping with the latest group of refugees. If you want to weep, and now I'm going to start getting global, but if you want to weep, and every once in a while I do give credit to institutions that I don't always give credit to. So God bless the New York Times. They are doing the story of Haiti. They've never done this. In my life, they've never done what they did this week, which is they ran the whole section on Haiti on Sunday, a whole separate section, and now they're running the story again, day by day. But this is an example. It is only one example. I'm not urging you to drop everything and be concerned about Haiti. This is only one example in which if you look at the roots of a current story, you discover things you don't want to know. You don't want to know what the mayor of Ferdinand Wood, the mayor of New York, did to support the kidnapping club. And you don't want to know that the story of Haiti, if I had to sum it up, comes from the fact that the Western nations led by France, now I want you just to hear this, required the only successful slave rebellion in the world, where slaves took over the country where they were slaves, required them to pay reparations to the people who had been their slaveholders, okay? France required that the brand new nation of Haiti pay reparations to France for the loss of their slave colony. And now, first time, we have an estimate by a lot of people, very smart people, that that probably cost Haiti over the last 200 years, I think, um, between 20 and 100 billion dollars. The analysis is all on the page two of today's Times. Mm -hmm. But anyway, here's this impoverished country which has refugees, which has all kinds of problems, and we're all going to respond to those problems, and we can't undo what happened in the, in the 1820s. But, but is, there is no more dramatic example I can give you of the fact that there are causes behind the causes behind the causes. Okay, so then you asked, look, um, we have global responsibilities also. We have global responsibilities because as Jews we are told to look out for where people are victims of a genocide or victims of oppression or victim or, or suffering in poverty. And we're told we have an obligation to that. Nobody, nobody imagines that anybody can do it locally, in their congregation, in their city, in their country, and globally all at once. That's, that's not possible. But we have global responsibilities. And some of those responsibilities, that's why I told you the story of Haiti, have to do with how do these things get in this bad way in the first place. And as people with a, with a storied and occasionally glory and glorious and occasionally in, inglorious, unglorious history, we know what some of those things were. But even if we didn't cause them, we have, a, we have a world today in which as bad as things are in the United States, in some areas, mm -hmm. as bad, as troubling as things are in this city, in many areas, there are also very, very serious global problems. And um, I did not, just so we're all clear, grow up with that international focus. I grew up with, a, as I see you discovered, a social justice commitment to making change in my city on lots and lots of local issues. And then I had the fortune and the misfortune, or whatever you want, of losing an election, you might all remember that, um, and looking for a job in 1997, and ending up um, being hired by American Jewish World Service. And for me, it was just like, this is a huge insight. There are problems all over the world. We, as America, addressed, in my judgment, some of you may feel free to disagree, but addressed too many of those problems 
with a geopolitical lens. Like, this is a country we want to help, this is a country we don't want to help, this will help us win some other alliance, this won't. And, and we don't address enough of them with a serious look at what is happening in some of these countries. What are the people on the ground doing to fight injustice? And they are doing amazing things, way beyond what most of us could imagine, including risking their lives. And wouldn't it, and isn't it powerful that there's a Jewish organization motivated by Jewish values that wants to step in in a Jewish way, and by that I mean not telling people what to do, but asking them to be the leaders and asking them how we can help. And so I think we have a huge global responsibility as well. And I'm happy to talk about that, but I want to say you asked it correctly, and I'd be the first to tell you that while I'm still working with American Jewish World Service, I'm still trying to educate rab rabbis and their congregations about taking on these issues and taking them on with a, with a level of moral courage. I don't want anybody to think that it's wrong just to be working on local issues. And I want to say this week that you know, you, you have, you raised, you started us on gun violence and that's where a lot of our focus and energy should be. But the notion, friends, that we live in a country that was incapable of figuring out that we were about to run short of infant formula and now seems incapable of doing anything to get desperately sick babies the, the formula they need in the richest country in the world is, has really left me mm. gobsmacked or whatever that expression mm -hmm. is. How is this work Jewish? That's a question I have to like help us remember as we are making the decisions that we make about the issues that we pick, but how do you think about, maybe it's really just, you know, maybe it's, if it's possible to say in a more personal way, how does your Judaism inform the work that you do? So, um, okay, I, li I like the second way you asked the question first. <laughs> no, because I think I can answer the first question, but. All right, I'll just take a crack at it for, look, you know, I was once accused, I don't know, I was, <laughs> went to some congregation where I was like a scholar in residence for a weekend, and so I did a, a little speech on Friday night to some people, and then I did the drash on Saturday, and then I did the kiddish lunch, and then on Sunday I taught a class, so some poor people had heard me like four times, and somebody <laughs> said to me, you are guilty of strip mining the Torah. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, like, you know, it says what it says, you know, you can pick out whatever sentences you want. It's a great, it's a great, thing. anyway, I say that to say that, you know, for me, the Torah lessons that answer your question are, are pretty basic. I, I think I, I have always loved the notion, I know it's a simple, all of these things are simple expressions, but I love the notion of justice, justice you shall pursue for two reasons. One is, uh, which I came to understand as some rabbinic teaching, that justice is in there twice because justice should not only be the end goal, but it also should be the means. Yes. And for me, that very much defines the way in which American Jewish World Service works. But I'm also enamored, without being a, a fluent Hebrew speaker or a linguist, I'm enamored of this word pursue, because it doesn't say, you should enjoy justice. It doesn't say you should create justice. It says you should pursue it. And for me, that means like you're going to be running all the time and you know, pace yourself. But this is something that you're looking for. It doesn't happen easily. So I take that very seriously. And I take very seriously the fundamental teaching that we were in this situation ourselves and we know what it's like. Um, and we need to know what it's like. And we need to think about it. OK, here's one of my um, little maxims. Next year, for Passover, put on your Passover plate, in addition to the orange and the tomato and the, there are lots of good, <laughs> lots of good things. Put on your Passover plate whatever um, historical information you have or can find about when your family came to America and why. Because I want to tell you, you might all be the exception that proves the rule, but I speak all over the United States, thanks to AJWS, I've been doing this for 20 years. Anybody under the age of 30, the most they know is what country their family came from. They have no idea of when or where or why. 
Yeah, they'll say, I, oh, I'm a Romanian. But like, okay, so when did your Romanian ancestors come and why? And, and you'll find some of them are the exception. They're doing, his, they're doing the history, they're looking for their families to put together um, family trees. But by and large, people don't know. And if we want to be responsive to waves of immigrants and challenges of refugees, and if we want, which I want us to, think about what the immigration laws should be, and I don't have the perfect answer, but I want, don't see enough thinking about it, you have to know that it's part of your story. And they're just like there are people, like the myth of the noble north, there's kind of a myth of when Jews came and how successful we've been, and that, no, I'm not denying any of that, but the question is why? Mm. And where do we come from? And what were the experiences? Because those experiences are being repeated, sometimes for Jews, and sometimes for other people around the world, and I just feel like we should know that. So, um, so that's um, pursuing justice and remembering that we were the other, and the AJWS maxim, which is everyone is, if everyone is equally made in the image of whatever you believe in, then as in a country, we don't do a nearly good enough job of asking people how we can help them. We decide how to, what to do for them. And that has not proved hugely successful, you might have noticed. Um, but, but um, however you ask the second half of the question, um, I'll, I'll stop there. So I was privileged, partly because of my mother's job, I guess solely because of my mother's job, to know Rabbi Heschel mm. in person. And so um, he is my hero. You asked that before and I didn't say that. But my favorite observation of all, and the one that's basically guided all of my political life when I was privileged to represent some of you, and all of my work at AJWS, Heschel said, in a free country where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the Jewish teaching par excellence. It's like, I didn't cause some of these problems. I can look at some of the history and figure out who did cause them, but it's not worth wasting lots of energy on that because I'm responsible for fi fixing them. Thank you for that. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy to hand you the mic as long as you're gonna ask a question. <laughs> if you have a statement that you would like to make, I will stick around for a few minutes afterwards and you can make your statements. Um, if I'd you love to ask, answer questions. That, look, I was um, proud to re represent you in politics for 20 years. I'm happy to be challenged on anything I've said. Can you, would you mind to pass it around? Raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You really are inspiring in this terrible moment that we're in. My question is, I have a 20-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. And what advice would you give them? What, what would you say to them to encourage them to be optimistic and resilient and to have the strength to do the work and the, engage in that pursuit of justice. So um, I think my answer to that question is sort of a shift from the way I've been talking, because one of the problems in the world in which we live for a very long time is that we never discuss the good news. So I mean, I asking you to go immerse yourself in five days of the story of Haiti, which will make you cry. Hmm. But it's a lot of bad news and a lot of bad actors. And I think it would really be worth, I don't think you should do this alone, but with them or in some areas where they're in it, look for some of the good news stories. Look for um, uh, the elections um, that, where people won by one vote. There are a lot of great stories. I can tell you some of them. Look for the times in which, and some of you were participants in some of this, you actually did some extended social action, demonstrations, whatever, that made a difference. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. But, but ask them to really look for the success stories in the world. When, when Joel was talking before about he didn't expect to be here 10 years ago. Okay, but he can tell you stories of places um, where it's impossible to get guns. And I can tell you that the voter turnout in the average election in, in America is 56%, and in Sweden and Switzerland and someplace else, it's 80-something percent. So those are stories that like, people can make a difference, things can change, 
And it's really important to, to urge them to see that and to then, and then I'd go back to what I said before, their issue may not be your issue. I think we are lucky that a lot of people in the, in the age cohort of your kids are beginning to look at our environmental issues. And I would urge them to do that. I would always say, don't just, don't just recycle, don't just demonstrate on the street, don't just, you know, abuse your parents because they can't figure out where the plastic bin, bin goes. <laughs> but, but look at the people who are doing legislative work and get connected to that. Um, and I would, I guess I want to say, although it's not easy to make this pop, but I would urge them as the citizens of this country to pay attention to the fact that many live actors are now trying to make it harder and harder for people to vote. And that's a challenge to the democracy. And you know what else? I mean, I talked to, there's a great group. Any of you have teenagers, it's a wonderful program called Etgar 36, which mm -hmm. takes a busload of kids yes. across the country. We can talk about that later. But I met with the, Etgar, I meet with the Etgar kids every year. And last year I met with them. And I don't know what the first question was from one of the kids, and I don't know what kind of mood I was in, not probably a great mood. <laughs> but they said, like, what do you have to say to us? And I said, I'm sorry. By which I meant we thought we solved some of these problems, and we, we didn't. We have a lot to learn. And so I think a little bit of humility sometimes is helpful, what, what you fought for, that it was good to fight for it, that it's better to, but, but to ask them to really look about, um, look, I'll, I'll go back to Heschel. Heschel's last interview on ABC television, you can Google this. Uh, he asked the reporter at the beginning of the, or the interviewer, at the beginning of the, before the program went on the air, he asked the interviewer to be sure to ask him about his advice for young people. And so at the very end of the interview, the, the interviewer says to him, Rabbi Heschel, what advice do you have for young people? Now I'm paraphrasing, so bear with me. He said, um, let them be sure to know that every word matters and every deed counts, but above all, remind them to build their lives as if they were works of art. So I think that's uh, talking to them about what they're going to make. And I also want to say, I want to go back to this notion of a good news story. This is just a funny story. But in the middle of my early years in politics, I have no idea what year this was. Let's say in the 1980s sometime, there was, no surprise, some big issue in Central America. And I was working with a group of clergy. And we were trying to lobby to get the UN to sanction some country or other. I don't even know what it was, but we had rabbis. and priests and we actually had an imam and we, were, and we were on 44th Street and 1st Avenue giving out leaflets. And there was a reporter, a very young reporter from WBAI with her tape recorder. And she was like, who's in charge here? And I'm like, I am. So she said, like, what is this all about? So I explained the issue to her. She said, well, why are you here? I said, well, what do you mean, why are we here? We are a group of clergy of different faiths and we're um, leafleting but why are you leafleting here? And I said, well, we're leafleting because the UN is across the street, so a lot of the people crossing the street here work in the UN, and we would like them to be thinking more seriously about this issue. And she said, I don't get it. And so I said, because I was feeling whatever, I looked at her and I said, you know, we stopped a war once. <laughs> and, you know, that might have been an exaggeration, but it was really, was the message was like, you know, public action made a difference. It made a difference in Vietnam. It made a difference in the civil rights movement. We're very clear now, or at least most of us are very clear about what it didn't do. And it's hard for young people, but I think they ought to know what you participated in and how you evaluated and which, which parts of your life you feel really good about where you were doing something good and then tell them we need them, and we need them to pick their areas and go study well and help us make a difference. We have time for maybe one more question. Michael, did you have your hand up? OK, good. Any time for one more question? Yes, please. Howard. Is the, is the mic on? Mic is not on, too. Back in the early 60s, I was hiding under a desk because we were afraid of a missile attack. Now kids are hiding under a desk because they're afraid of uh, going into closets because they're afraid of guns. And it seems like this, guns have been out there for a long time. And even though civil rights needs a long way to go, and there has been progress made since the 60s. Guns, it seems. How did we 
So, you know, all I can say, which I hope I've been trying to say all evening, is we can all imagine and see the ways in which it would be worse if nobody was protesting, if nobody was fighting back. Um, there, are, there are more than enough evil forces looking to take, take us over in a variety of ways, you know, looking to roll back taxes. I mean, we can do it. So, I, I, for me, I, I take some refuge in the Heschel quote. I, I feel responsible. And I know there are things to do, and I need sometimes myself to go sit quietly and think about, like, pick two issues that you're going to work on with more energy. Because, but, but I know how much worse things could be, and I see a lot of examples around the world of how much worse things could be. Um, and so, you know, I take delight in the places where I think we've been successful, and I just couldn't be clearer that what you said is true. There's a lot of work to do, and sometimes it feels like we're rolling backwards, but let's look at what could be different, and let's start thinking about what role we have in it. And there's lots of questions. You know, you pick an area. We can, we can each examine our own issues and our own behavior um, and think about what else to do. Your kids, your kids, they're, um, I'm just randomly mentioning, um, the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Andrew Goodman was murdered in Mississippi, was in school with my sister, so it's a family mm. issue for us. But the Andrew Goodman Foundation finds kids on campuses to be um, uh, boating ambassadors. Mm. And, and I promise you, I promise you, if every kid on every campus, big, I'm talking about big campuses in this country voted, we would have different people in Congress. And kids go off to college, and well, however you raise them, you might have raised them perfectly, but you know, they're not all voting. And, you know, we won an election in a couple of states last year because lots of people, including the Andrew Goodman Foundation, got every student to register to vote. By the way, in Texas, just in case you'd like to, in Texas, if you have a student ID, it is not acceptable. If you have a student ID that says you live in Lowell, house and here's your address, that's not sufficient to register to vote. Hmm. But a gun carry permit is. So these are rules, state by state. And that one I know is true for Texas, because Beto O'Rourke told me that. Uh -huh. um, but, but there are examples all over the country. And that's something you can do on campuses, is uh, we actually won this fight. I'm so old. We won this fight. In Morningside Heights, probably somebody in this room was a student then, in 19, I don't remember. Um, I would say 1960s, in the 1960s or the early 1970s, we took a case to court with the local assemblyman for the right of Columbia students to register to vote there, hmm. um, which turned an election. And there are a lot of stories like that. So urge them to look at, look at their lives and think about how to build that work of art. Last and, there, and there are great things being done by your young people, right? Okay, you know, Greta Thunberg is leading the fight for environmental change. Malala is leading the fight for girls' right to determine when they get married and to get an education. These, these young people are incredibly brave. Last, last question. Yes, sir. When we, were, when we were talking, you said you had an acronym oh, about yes. our responsibility to make the world a better place, and I thought maybe that would be a good place for us to... Good. So I've just developed this. I'm trying it out, so I'm open to being wordsmithed and chopped and whatever. <laughs> um, but it goes to what I said before, which is if you're working on an issue or your kids are working on an issue, get used to asking why are things the way they are. So I've now developed the acronym Y, W-H-Y. W stands for why are things the way they are or who is behind this. H stands for how can I intervene to make a difference and Y stands for yes, I will. One more time. So why, is, why are things the way they are? So let's, for example, we don't have an immigration policy. How can I get involved? I'm going to look for the people in Washington who are moving a sane immigration policy. Oh, I'll give you another issue in a minute. And then the why is simply your commitment. So yes, I will do this or that. And, and really making that as a chart for yourself. So it's an acronym that takes you from the questioning to the information to the decision to the action. I know that you uh, just came up with the acronym, but that uh, encapsulates your life's work.
the ways in which you inspire us, the ways in which you agitate us, the ways in which you don't let us off the hook, the ways in which you uh, help us believe that change is possible. So I really want to thank you for being with us tonight and for your, uh, the work that you've done for so long and the, works that you're, the work that you're still doing. Um, I want to thank Federation for sponsoring this evening. I want to invite all of you to thank Ruth Messenger for Thanks all for coming.